Today we will look at the study of prayer and the precepts of the church to round up our study of all the Christian basics. Stick around for Sunday School. Thank you for joining us for Sunday School. I'm Father Timothy Matkin, your instructor. Before we begin our final study on prayer and the precepts of the church, if you'd look down below into the description, you will find links to the show notes, the script basically for this lecture. Also, if you'd like to learn more and read the book from which these lectures are based, you can pick up the collection called The Romance of Orthodoxy from the lectures of Father Homer Rogers. Also, if you would do us a favor and bless that like button, we would greatly appreciate it and share it on your timeline so that other people can uh, be exposed to these teachings on the Christian faith and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. Before we begin in, get into our study today, we want to open up with a prayer from the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray. Prevent us, O Lord, in all our doings with thy most gracious favor and further us with thy continual help, that in all our works begun, continued, and ended in thee, we may glorify thy holy name, and finally, by thy mercy, obtain everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, today we bring it all to a conclusion, talking about prayer and the precepts of the church. Now, it's often said that canned prayer, that is, prayer out of the book, is not really prayer at all, but just vain repetition, as Jesus says. Real prayer, we're told, is has to be spontaneous. It has to come straight from the heart. However, the first time a person is asked to pray spontaneously in public before other people, he's likely to feel slightly embarrassed. One is reluctant to share one's deepest thoughts and feelings with relative strangers. The temptation is to rehearse so that when called upon, one has something to say. Under such circumstances, one's real Spontaneous prayer from the heart might go like this. Oh God, how do I manage to get in such situations? I really hate the leader for calling on me. I feel like these other people are judging me and snickering at me for my clumsy and ridiculous ability to pray. I know that's what I was doing when they were praying. Some of them may feel sorry for me. None of this is honest enough to admit it. So, we keep up this hateful pretense of being pious. God, if you can hear me, let me get through the next two or three minutes without making too much of a, an ass of myself. Let remember those phrases that I rehearsed. Amen. That really would be a spontaneous prayer from the heart. It's not easy to learn to pray spontaneously. Some people learn to do it with great eloquence, but if you analyze free prayer, you will often discover that one uses many standard phrases learned from the prayers of others on different occasions, as well as previous personal thoughts and prayers. Once he's learned how to say some particular thing very well, the next time he wants to express the same thing, he will probably say it the same way. Father A.G. Herbert tells the following story. At the conclusion of the First World War, a young Englishman was doing Red Cross work in Greece. He had a few days off, so he took a trip to the famous Mount Athos and visited a Greek Orthodox monastery. There are plenty of them all over the island. When the time came to leave, one of the monks had to go to the same city, so they decided to travel together. The first night when they stopped at an inn, the Englishman knelt down and said his prayers before he got into bed. But the monk simply changed into his, into his pajamas and got in bed. The next morning, the Englishman got out of bed, knelt down and said his morning prayers, got up and dressed, and got ready for breakfast. The monk simply got up and got dressed. That night, it was the same story all again, and that went on for three days. Morning and night, the Englishman knelt down and said his prayers, but the monk never did. Finally, when the Englishman just couldn't stand it any longer. He had to say to the monk, pardon me for asking, but 
I know your life is dedicated to prayer, but when we've been traveling together for three days, I've never seen you pray. I, I, I don't understand. The monk answered, oh, well, that's simple. I belong to a praying community. When I'm in the monastery, I take my part in the prayers. When I have to be away, the prayers still go on. Christian prayer is first and foremost corporate prayer, and all Christian prayer is worship. The church is the committee which exists to do that on behalf of all creation. We pray because prayer is profoundly appropriate to our situation. God sent His Son to rescue us from slavery to lust and compulsions and phobias and all sorts of terrible things. He gave His life for us. Somebody ought to say, thank you. God does care about the little things in our lives, but He does not resent it because we pray for such things. All the more importance we give to, ver to the very little things, so much more importance we should give to the things that really matter. Our primary purpose in the church is not to ask God so much for the, for the little things, but to praise Him for our creation, for our preservation, and for our redemption, for the means of grace, and for the hope of glory, and for all the blessings of this life. The Christian church is the new humanity, which corporately recognizes and accepts this duty and sees it as a privilege. And the Holy Eucharist is the primary, but by no means the only way that the church carries out that work, that work of worship and prayer, of praising God and saying, thank you. If I went into my closet and wrote a fan letter to Farrah Fawcett, you can see how old these lectures are, or whoever the latest beauty queen is, and then I sneak out and put it in the mailbox when no one was looking, that would seem like a very private, personal act. But several days later, when it got to her home, it would be only one of thousands from her public. In a sense, we could say that there is no such thing as a truly private prayer. Every morning, day and night, somewhere in the world, the Holy Eucharist is being celebrated. But if that were not so, if I were the only one in the world doing it, the angels and archangels would still be joining in in heaven. And if they were not doing it, Jesus the Word, who never ceases to make intercession for us, would still be doing it. For the majority of the Christians who have ever lived, prayer has meant taking part in the Eucharist on Sunday and perhaps on other weekdays, and then saying throughout the week the Lord's Prayer, the Hail Mary, and the Gloria Patri. Why do Anglicans pray out of a book, out of a prayer book like this? Well, we do it for a number of reasons. Some of them are because our prayer is official. It is like the sheriff when he bangs on the door and says, open up in the name of the law. Our prayer is in the name of Jesus, so we want to be sure that we pray as he wants us, wants us to pray. Also, because we are making common prayer, just like it says right in the book, common prayer. And if we're going to make common prayer, we have a, a limited number of choices. We can pray simultaneously in silence, or we can take turns praying and let one person speak out loud while the rest of us listen. We can say in unison prayers that we all know by heart, or we can agree in advance on our prayers and have them in a book so that we can all pray them out loud together. Also, God deserves majesty in our worship, which takes careful thought and preparation, planning, writing things down. Also, our private prayers grow out of our common worship, which magnificently expresses all the deepest human concerns. We learn the language of prayer from our common prayer. What separates Shakespeare and Archbishop Cranmer from you and me is not what was in their hearts, but rather their ability to give expression to what is deepest in the hearts of all of us. Also, the great written prayers, when familiar, can have the power to put us in kind of a praying mood. Also, we pray out of a book for the same reason that we sing out of a book. 
hymns, songs, or prayers? What if hymns had to be spontaneous, had to be spontaneous, and could never be repeated after we sung them once? In fact, the more we sing a hymn and the more familiar it becomes, the greater its ability to put us in communion with God. Think of all those lovely Christmas carols. The same thing is true about prayer. The more familiar we become with a particular prayer, the more deeply it becomes our own, the more it kind of sinks in. Also, we need a balanced diet of prayer. The Book of Common Prayer gives us that balance of praise and adoration, thanksgiving, confession, intercession, and petition. But if we pray only what is in our hearts, only what we're conscious of, it tends to be mostly petition and intercession. And the other important types often just get left out. So the prayer book tends to raise our consciousness to the praying that we need to be doing and that we might otherwise forget. But God forbid that we should only pray out of a book. The prayer book is mostly for newcomers and visitors. Both prayers and memorized prayers are really exercises in prayer. The printing press with movable type appeared in the West right about the time of the Reformation. The first books that were published were copies of the Bible. The next books were devotional books, collections of prayers, designed to prime the pump of prayer. So they were called primers, or as the English pronounced it, primers. The leaders of the Reformation had been raised on primers, so they were well primed with the ideas and phraseology of prayer. As a result, they were able spontaneously to pray very well without necessarily using a book, without reading it right out of the primer, and they urged their followers to do the same. That emphasis on spontaneous prayer from the heart produced a generation which did not use primers and thus grew up poorly primed. Thus the great tradition of free prayer was weakened a bit, and that was kind of the opposite of what those reformers would have wanted. And God forbid that we should pray into a book. The people's part in the Eucharist changes very little, or even not at all, from week to week. Even newcomers very quickly begin to learn it by heart. So to put the prayer book down and pay attention to what is happening in the service. The ceremonies become a, an important part of the worship, and also putting down the service sheet and listening to the lessons, not reading along, but listening as they are articulated and read out loud. They're being proclaimed. They're meant to be sung and heard. Only read if you're hard of hearing or if you need to concentrate. Man was intended to be at home in the world of the spirit as much as in the world of matter and the animal senses. But because of that inscrutable event referred to as the fall, we've lost the natural ability to penetrate and enjoy the world of the spirit. That which should be all light has become murky, darkness and shadow, and we're left with the world of animal sense and heartbreak and yearning for that other world. When the light from that other world breaks through, it hurts our eyes. Jesus, the light of light. We're left with a preoccupation with that world of the senses. We're left without the guidance of the Spirit, turned in upon ourselves, and things are disordered. The point of prayer, and of all religion, is to lift man back into the world of the Spirit, so that he's increasingly at home in that kind of world. Christians believe that this reality, the spiritual reality, hovers just beyond the boundary of our awareness. It is personal, supra-personal, and he's in love with his creation. Twenty centuries ago, he came out of that world to inhabit this world, our world, by taking our nature upon himself in the womb of the Virgin in Palestine. Even though he lived in this world, he lived with the life of that world. He carried our nature through death into the glare of that world's brilliance and beauty. And then he revealed to his friends and flashes, flashes called post-resurrection appearances, his continuing presence with them just beyond the edge of their bodily senses. 
He is here in this room in all of His glory. He is where you are. If we, as it were, strain and squint, sometimes we can almost see Him there. But He continues to abide with His friends, lovingly watching over them, guiding them always to Himself. There are certain breakthrough points in which He comes to His friends. We call those the sacraments. Prayer is our response to that unseen and beckoning presence as we tune in or open up our minds and hearts to the presence of Him who loves us so much. It is the Church's belief that the Holy One from beyond not only is by our side, but actually pervades us, living in our spirits, uniting us to Himself in an intimacy that we cannot imagine, in a kind of mutual indwelling or mingling of spirits. We look outward at the distant mountains or upward at the stars, and we're filled with awe at the mystery of it all. The same mystery, though, is within us, even more mysterious and beautiful. I am more remarkable than a galaxy or a rainbow. I don't feel like it sometimes, but I really am, and so are you. If anyone love me, said our Lord, my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. John 14, 23. And again he says in Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him, and he with me. Prayer, we might say, is the way of opening the door. St. Paul says, I live, yet not I. My life is not really mine, but Christ. The splendor, the majesty, the mystery, the beauty, the beloved, He lives within me. Now, God respects the freedom that He's given us, and He doesn't overwhelm us. Prayer is a kind of rare stat where we can tune in and control the voltage of the supernatural to keep it from blowing our minds. In baptism, the divine indwelling begins and grows to make us more at home in the world of the Spirit as we yield our unruly and frightened wills and frozen hearts to the presence within us. It's gradual and progressive and increases our awareness of the presence of God in us and changes us and makes us more and more like the humanity that He assumed, integrating and harmonizing and unifying all our faculties inviting us to love as He loves, planting His virtues in us and in all things, making us not less but more our distinctive unique selves as we become transparent to the beauty which inhabits within us. His Spirit is in us, inciting, prompting, urging us to yield up our heart to His remaking of us in His likeness. Prayer is yielding to His rule. In every contact between God and man, God always takes the initiative. As St. Augustine said, your seeking God proves that you've already found Him. Let's imagine that I do some good and loving thing, and God sees it. He says, oh my goodness, I wish I had thought of that. Well, I'm not going to think up some goodness which God has not already thought of. Any such impulse in me is really my response to God's prior action in my soul. That prior action is called prevenient grace, the grace which goes before. As you recall, there is only one grace, as it were. It is God's life being lived in the human soul. But we receive the one grace in various ways, and grace has various effects upon us. The different kinds of grace in that sense are really references to the way that we receive it or to what it does in our lives. The union of the soul with God, which begins at baptism, is called sanctifying grace or habitual grace because it stays with us. God's actual personal indwelling is called uncreated grace, God Himself who has no beginning. The effect of uncreated grace is to change the character of the soul in response and that is called created grace, God's effect upon us. Created grace is assisted in times of need by actual grace through prayer, 
through sermons, Bible reading, music, or conversations, and when we receive the sacraments by sacramental grace. It's a common mistake to identify the action of God upon the soul with the feelings that may go along with it. Actually, there may not be any special feelings at all. Emotions in themselves are not spiritual things. We share emotions with animals, with dogs and cats. There's no such thing as a spiritual emotion. Mystical experience is immediate experience of reality. This experience of reality is not mediated, it's direct. It doesn't involve or employ the bodily senses. Mystical experience cannot be verified objectively because it's not that kind of thing. It doesn't involve the senses. The great spiritual masters, such as St. John of the Cross, tell us to pay no attention to ecstatic experiences. They usually occur at the beginning of spiritual development and on rare occasions toward the end. Experiences which are indistinguishable from spiritual ecstasy then can be produced by non-spiritual causes. They can be fake, if you will. When ecstatic or charismatic experiences are really from God, their purpose is to draw the soul into a deeper life of prayer and worship. And then they usually cease because they've done their job. They are pump primers to help us get started, enthusiasm to get us going. So it's a mistake to try to go back and recreate that experience. That's a little like trying to go back to one's childhood, as much as sometimes we long to do, or on the other side, just refusing to grow up. True mystical experience cannot be communicated to another person because it's not a matter of bodily experience, and so we have no common language in which to talk about it. From the time of St. Paul to the present, the, all the authorities on the subject agree that the only test of such matters is whether or not it makes you nicer to your spouse, a better person, a kinder person, a more holy person. As St. Paul says, if we speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm nothing. I gain nothing. Finally, no matter how advanced we get in our prayer life, we never outgrow our need and obligation to engage in the public prayer of the church. Now let's take a closer look at the church's rule or plan of prayer for her spiritual life. Besides the Eucharist, the most common form of corporate prayer is the divine office or the daily office, also known in the church as morning and evening prayer, or matins and evensong, or for short, simply just called the office. In 587 BC, the Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom of Judah and carried away many, if not most, of the people to Babylon, where they remained for a generation for 50 years. The Jews, the people of Judah, interpreted these events as God's punishment for disobeying the Torah. And so there in Babylon, they set out to seriously and systematically study God's law. In the process, they pulled together the various writings which make up the first part of the Old Testament. The men met each Sabbath under the leadership of a man schooled in the law called a master, or in Hebrew, a rabbi. In those weekly meetings, they read passages from the collected writings, listened to a commentary on the passage by the rabbi, they sang psalms, and they recited prayers. When, after 50 years, the next generation returned to Jerusalem, they continued those Bible study, prayer, and praise meetings. Thus was born the Jewish synagogue, literally the congregation or assembly which is ecclesia, or church, from the Greek. The first Christians, of course, were converted Jews. They thought of themselves as Jews of the New Covenant, the true Israel of God. So they continued that synagogue pattern of worship. It would have been unthinkable not to do it. And now the commentary is an interpretation of the Old Testament scriptures 
in the light of Christ, their fulfillment. But they didn't stop with the synagogue service. They celebrated the Lord's Supper as well, which is also a transformed version of a Hebrew institution. The combination of the synagogue service with the supper is what we know today as the two parts of the Eucharistic liturgy. In the 4th century AD, after the cities of the Roman Empire had largely been converted, many young men felt that the church was going to the dogs. So they went out and went into the wild countryside to, to get away from all the corruption of the cities and to spend their lives in prayer and the study of the Holy Scriptures. At first they lived like hermits, all alone. But soon, there were so many of them, they began to kind of cluster together and form communities. And these communities developed a pattern of worship, which was an expansion of the liturgy of the Word. At several set times during this day, they would stop everything and assemble for a brief service of prayer, scripture reading, and the singing of psalms. The names of those brief services are Matins, Lauds, Prime, Terse, Sext, Known, Vespers, and Compline. They're derived from the Eucharistic sanctification of the various hours of the day. So sometimes, modern times, they're called the Liturgy of the Hours. The Christians in the cities began to feel that the monks out in the wilderness were the real Christians and so their pattern of worship came to be considered the ideal. As a result, the poor parish priest, who had enough to do already, discovered that he was expected to live up to the standard set by the monks. He was expected to recite at least part of the divine office, as it was called. At the time of the English Reformation, Archbishop Cranmer, when he translated the liturgy into English, had a daring idea. He simplified the eight offices into two. Matins, lauds, and prime were merged together as morning prayer. And then vespers and compline were merged into an evening prayer. His idea was that every morning all the men of the village would stop by the church for matins on their way to the fields or to the merchant shop. And then they would go on their way home and they would stop by for evensong. It was a great idea, but never fully caught on, except in a few places. However, the priests used the new simplified offices, and on Sunday morning, just before the Eucharist, morning prayer was always read in church. Then, that evening, evening prayer would be read in the church. In the cathedrals, of course, it would be chanted. Evening prayer became even song. During colonial times, there were no bishops in the Anglican, or sorry, the American colonies, as a result of the pressure put on the English government by the dissenters in the colonies. In order for a man to be ordained, he had to spend a year in an expensive and dangerous round trip to England. This produced a severe shortage of priests in the colonies. One priest usually served a large number of parishes, which he would visit in rotation. It might be several months before he could get to them all, so the Eucharist could not be celebrated every Sunday in any given parish church in that situation. On those Sundays where no priest was there, where he was off at a different church, morning prayer was conducted by a layman. The result was that the people came to be accustomed to having the Eucharist only once a quarter or so, and that best only monthly. What started out as a necessity, after it was no longer necessary, continued as kind of a bad habit. There was another factor which discouraged weekly celebration of the Eucharist, both in England and the colonies. Before the Reformation, the practice had developed of what we would call non-communicating masses, in which only the priest received communion, and the lay people only made their communions a few times a year, Christmas, Easter, Pentecost, that sort of thing. The Anglican reformers knew this was a practice that needed to be corrected. So they insisted that the priest would not be allowed to celebrate without at least one person to receive communion with him. Anyone who intended to receive was obliged to tell the priest by the night before. And if no one did, then the priest had, when the priest had concluded the liturgy of the word, 
He simply had to stop there. Since old habits, and even bad habits, die hard, the lay people were not eager to change their old pre-Reformation habits. So on most Sundays, in many if not most churches, the services were matins and what we call anti-communion. Anti as an A-N-T-E, that which comes before the communion. And this was the, sin the situation until the 19th century. As a result of this and various religious and political conflicts it went through, by the end of the 18th century, the Church of England was, as you can imagine, spiritually exhausted. But in 1832, at Oxford University, a great revival began in the Church of England, and it quickly spread to America. It's called the Oxford Movement. As one of the fruits of the Oxford Movement, a great campaign was begun to restore the ancient and once universal practice of having the Eucharist every Sunday. But as we've already noted, people are reluctant to change the worship practices they were raised with. They were not willing to give up morning prayer. As the next best thing, priests began adding an additional service early at 7.30 or 8 o'clock on Sunday morning. And that was always the Eucharist. It came to be more known as the early service, or the 8 o'clock. Usually only a minority of the parish attended it. The majority continued to come at 11 a.m. or so for morning prayer every Sunday of the month, except perhaps once a month, the first Sunday, when the Eucharist would be celebrated at that time. The common speculation among historians and liturgical scholars is that the 8 o'clock strategy may have slowed down the restoration of the Eucharist as the principal service every Sunday for every major celebration. Nevertheless, the weekly Eucharist as the main service on Sundays is almost the universal practice in Anglican and Episcopal churches today. The ideal pattern of public corporate prayer in an ordinary parish would be something like this. Daily morning prayer, daily Eucharist, and at least once on Sunday, perhaps more if needed, and daily evening prayer. Basically what we're talking about is the prayer book round of services. In some parishes, daily morning and evening prayer are conducted by a layman on a rotating schedule. At any rate, the daily office will be read in private by the priest if he doesn't read it in public. To a newcomer to an Anglican church, sometimes it seems as if the priest is saying the prayers too fast or without enough emotion and expression. There's a reason for the way that he does it. He must avoid intruding his personality or his feelings on the congregation. That would be a distraction to everybody else and would prevent them from bringing their own feelings into the prayers. So he says it basically in kind of a, a blank sort of way, and the people can add their own element into that recitation. He should try to present the text of the prayers accurately so that the sense is clear but leave the individual participants to supply their own interpretations. There are, in general, two classes of distraction which one encounters during public common worship. You can be distracted from the liturgy by your own senses or thoughts and reactions to things going on around you, including the way the service is conducted. For example, what is that smell? Or, oh, I just remembered I forgot to put the roast in the oven. Or, boy, the choir sure sounded awful on that anthem, and so on. When that kind of distraction occurs, the thing to do is drag your attention back to the words which are being said in the service. This is a time when you might want to follow the words on the page in the prayer book. Or you might find yourself distracted by God. When that happens, you would be a fool to try to turn your attention back to the words of the service. The purpose of the liturgy in the first place is to draw your attention to God. The purpose of the words is to form our intention and to act as a shield against distractions of the first kind so that we can be distracted by God. A celebration of the Eucharist which was conducted perfectly and in which you participated fully would leave you unaware of the passage of time. It would simply be contemplation and as you left the church, 
you would feel like you had been in heaven because that's exactly where you would have been with the angels and the archangels and all the company of heaven. Well, now let's talk about the precepts of the church. Jesus says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Assuming that I do, how do I do that? How do I put it into practice? Although the answer is vast and complicated, the church kind of boils it down to what are called six precepts of the church, six simple rules to follow. In our Lord's command, there are three parties to be loved, God, my neighbor, and myself. And I have, we might say, two selves, my social self and my private self, the inside and the outside. That is, I'm both a member of the human race and the church, and also I'm little old me. So there are two ways for me to love God, two ways to love my neighbor, and two ways to love myself. Thus, works out to be six precepts of the church. Number one is about the Eucharist. The first precept has to do with my love of God in those social terms. Jesus said, do this. And when he said that, he meant, do this ceremony that we call the Eucharist. In the prayer of consecration, we speak of the Eucharist as our bounden duty and service. From the time of the apostles to the 16th century, no Christian would have thought of going to the church on Sunday to do anything in place of taking part in the offering of the Mass, the Eucharistic sacrifice. In apostolic times, if one was deliberately absent from the Eucharist on Sunday, he usually did not come back. It was considered to be such a serious repudiation of both God and the fellowship of the church. To miss the Eucharist unnecessarily on Sunday was always held to be a serious sin. Thus, there are really only three excuses for being absent from the Eucharist on a Sunday. The first is sickness or some kind of incapacity. And this is a matter of one's own judgment. But if one is not too sick to have gone to work on a weekday or to school, then they're probably not too sick to go to church. Half of the world's work gets done every day by people who are maybe not feeling very well. Now, if you are too sick to go to church, the priest will be happy to visit you and bring you Holy Communion if you ask, particularly if it's something that's going to go on for a little while. It's not an excuse that you have out-of-town company or that you stayed out late on Saturday night. The second reason is the unavailability of the Eucharist. It's also a matter of private judgment on one's part how far it's reasonable to travel to get to the Eucharist. However, there are places in, in the Philippines, for example, where Anglicans travel all Saturday afternoon on foot through jungles and so on to a village where the Eucharist will be celebrated. They may even spend the night there, take part in the Eucharist, eat Sunday dinner, and then walk all the way back home on Sunday afternoon. Morning or evening prayer are never substitutes for the Eucharist, no matter at what hour they are read, if the Eucharist is available and being celebrated. And the third is some kind of conflict with a notable work of charity, something that is specific to that time that can't be done later. You can't rearrange your schedule or it's too late to do so. For example, nursing someone who can't be left alone or taking someone to the hospital in an emergency, pulling over by the roadside and giving someone assistance on your way to church, that kind of thing. So this includes people who have to work on Sunday for reasons of public health and safety, or it's, it's the only job you can get, and that's the situation. But under those circumstances, it is your duty to ask your priest to celebrate the Eucharist at a time when you can attend. Perhaps there's a different parish that you can attend once in a while that meets your schedule. Celebrations on Sunday, other than the principal one, are really for those who are prevented from coming to it on Sunday morning, not just so they, th they can go fishing or something like that. The ideal one celebration in the place, the ideal is one celebration in the place, because more than one on a regular basis 
begins to kind of undermine the very unity which the Eucharist is, des is designed to strengthen. In fact, the Eastern Orthodox brethren feel so strongly about this that they actually forbid more than one celebration at a given altar by the same priest on any one day. By consensus, the members of the Church, as expressed in their practice over the centuries, five of the days are considered to have the same rank and obligation as Sundays. Like Sundays, they are what we call holy days of obligation. The obligation is we're expected to attend. And these can vary from place to place, country to country, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. There may be local feast days that are added to this list. But the, the ones that are kind of universal are Christmas Day, also called the Feast of the Nativity, the Birth of Christ, which is celebrated in recognition of the beginning of His redeeming work. New Year's Day, which is the Feast of the Holy Name of Jesus, or the Circumcision, is celebrated in recognition of His being subject to the law of the Old Covenant, and a little hint of the passion which awaited Him later in life. The Feast of the Epiphany on January 6th, also known as the Manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles, this feast celebrates the visit of the wise men and the baptism of Jesus. Ascension Day, which is the Thursday, always on a Thursday, 40 days after Easter, on which we celebrate the taking of our humanity with Christ into heaven as Jesus, true God and true man, returns to the Father. And then finally, November 1st is All Saints Day, which we celebrate the triumph of Christ in redeemed humanity. In our particular jurisdiction, there's a little caveat in that All Saints Day can also be commemorated on the Sunday following, and so that obligation can be met on that following Sunday. The second precept, number two, has to do with my love of God as an individual, and this is about receiving Holy Communion. St. Paul says, If ye do eat and drink the body and blood of Christ unworthily, ye do eat and drink damnation unto yourselves. The sacrament always has an effect on you, whether that effect is for good or evil. If you are disposed toward evil, it will kind of strengthen that disposition for evil. And then vice versa, if you are disposed toward good, it will nourish and strengthen that good. Therefore, you should spend at least a few minutes before the Eucharist begins to, to be sure that you have thought about your life and repented of all the known sins you can remember. Also, are you in love and charity with your neighbors? If you, if you have some grudge against someone, you should never receive the Holy Eucharist in that condition. Make sure you intend to follow that new life in Christ. So before the Eucharist begins, spend a few moments in prayer, in self-reflection, examining whether you are in a condition to receive the Holy Eucharist. Now, after you've received Holy Communion, deliberately thank God for that great privilege. You can do this while the priest is taking the ablutions, you know, up there at the altar doing the dishes, as it were, or after the dismissal, after the final hymn. This one, reason, this one reason why we shouldn't be talking in church, this is one reason why we shouldn't be talking in church either before or after the service. It's a time for prayer preparation, and thanksgiving. Number three, the third precept, has to do with my love of my neighbor in social terms, and this is about supporting the church. We are a family. The church is our mother. She has her faults, as did my own natural mother, but I'm not going to talk about her faults to people outside the church. We should have a filial loyalty to her, and also loyalty to each other, as brothers and sisters in Christ. The premises of the church are our home. The parish hall is like our living room. There's work to be done around the place. Each of us should do his share. This includes such things as the altar guild and the choir, work parties, youth ministries, and so on. They support our mission and build up our community. One should also undertake to bear his fair share of the expenses of the church. The biblical standard is 10% of your income. That's what we call the tithe. No one who tithed over the long haul has ever regretted it. Everyone ought to be either supporting the church 
or the church needs to be supporting them if they're in that situation. The parish priest administers an almoner or discretionary alms fund through which money can be anonymously contributed for the support of people in need. There are three fundamental reasons for giving money to the church. First, to express our gratitude to God for all of His blessings. Secondly, to declare by our actions that we recognize that really all of it belongs to God. And third, to discipline our bodily appetites, our greed. One's pledge, what they plan to give to the church, should be large enough so that it makes one careful in what one does with the rest of one's money, which can have the effect of increasing a sense of being responsible to God. If you can play, pay your pledge without batting an eye and without missing it, your pledge probably is too small. If so, it should be increased until it puts a slight pressure on you. If one is not presently tithing, he should increase the percentage that he gives each year, even if ever so slightly, until he gets to that tithing level of 10%. And of course, you're not limited to 10%. Number four is about confession. So this fourth precept has to do with my love as an individual of my neighbor. All of one's relationships are to be kept in the context of love. And so at the very least, I will make my confession whenever, because of grave sin, I need to do so. And it would be good for my soul and my spiritual growth if I do so even at other times, simply out of obedience, out of trying to form a good habit. Number five is about marriage. So this fifth precept has to do with my love of myself in social terms. One will strive to achieve and maintain a Christian family life. This means keeping the church's law of marriage and endorsing it both by personal witness and by vocal support. And number six has to do with fasting and abstinence. So this sixth precept has to do with my love of myself, the individual. Frequently, there's a conflict between what I ought to do and what I want to do. And more often than not, what I should do is what I feel least like doing. Being holy means being able to choose to do what I should, even when I don't feel like it. The church provides us with a set of exercises to develop and maintain the ability to do just that, and that's called fasting and abstinence. Fasting means cutting down on the quantity of food one eats, that is, lighter meals or skipped meals. Ash Wednesday and Good Friday are the two strict fast days on the prayer book calendar. Lent is also a season for fasting. Fasting is also customary on Wednesdays and during Advent. Abstinence is a slightly different thing. That refers to the quality of the food that one, one eats or doesn't eat, refraining from something in particular. So one does not eat the flesh of warm-blooded animals on the Fridays of the year, except those which come during the seasons of Christmas and Easter or the octaves of Christmas and Easter. Depends on which jurisdiction you're in and which set of rules under which prayer book you're adhering to. Because every Friday is like a little commemoration of Good Friday, a special day of abstinence. The 1928 prayer book sets apart these days and specifically called, quote, days of abstinence. The 1979 prayer book simply says they are to be observed with acts of, quote, discipline and self-denial. When circumstances allow, we should observe days of devotion as days of abstinence from meat, in following the tradition of our ancestors. Besides these days of devotion, there are also ember seasons, which occur four times a year and are indicated on the church calendar. They occur basically whenever we change from one season to another, from summer to fall and fall to winter and so on. There are always a Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday of that time period. It's traditional on Ember Days to abstain from meat and also to pray for the clergy of the church because these Ember Days were days of ordinations. Throughout history and in most parts of the world today, meat has been strictly a luxury food 
not necessarily something that was part of everyday life. A majority of the members of the Anglican Communion live in the Third World. For most of them, meat is still a luxury food. And correspondingly, every Sunday of the year is like a little Easter. It's always a feast day. It's the most appropriate day of the week for a party or a dance or some kind of festivity. And Friday is the least appropriate day for those things. So remember the precepts of the church, those six rules for living out the church's life. Well, thank you for watching this series. We're so glad you've joined us for Sunday School. We'll begin another segment of Sunday School on a different topic next week, and I hope you'll come back and join us then. We're going to do a study on the Bible and the pandemic, learning all about uh, what the Old Testament and the New Testament might have to say for our own situation going through this plague of the coronavirus. Again, thank you for joining. If you would like to join us in person, you can look us up and learn all about us at stfrancisdallas.org. Please like and share, and we will see you there. God bless. Oh,